you never had to make a drill competitive. You went into every practice going, we need to not make this competitive because it might blow up. Hey. <laughs> so we literally called it cause you proof. Like every practice plan, we would cause you proof it to make sure our practice didn't blow up. Hi, I'm Corey Baldwin. And I'm Dan Searle, and we're back with a new Off the Beaten Path, a podcast for basketball coaches living in obscurity, working in obscurity, and a few who have made it out of obscurity. <laughs> and uh, it's a place for storytelling, learning, connecting, sometimes reconnecting, uh, and food for thought, uh, food for the belly, my favorite kind. Sure is. And on today's episode, we meet the Travis clan. This is a basketball family through and through. So welcome, coaches. We've got Milt, Josh, and Jacob. It is an honor to have you on the show today, guys. An honor to be here. Thank you. All right. Well, let, let's get it started. All right. M Milt, walk us through here. You got you got two sons right there that you got to be proud of that are in coaching, but kind of walk us through when they were knuckleheads running around. Uh, as, <laughs> you as put young it in past tense. <laughs> no matter what story he tells right here, he's going to end it, and that was last week. So. <laughs> All right. So give, give us – when you first started coaching, how old were they, or did you start before them? Uh, I coached a little bit before they came along, but not much. Um, I had uh, uh, Josh was born when I was 21, and my wife was 18, and so I was in college trying to play football. And, uh, I no, Josh went to college with us. So that Jacob was born while we were there, and they have a younger sister who was also coached a little bit. And uh, we, uh, they, uh, they grew up in the gym and on the field. And I coached football 13 years in addition to basketball. They've been around it their whole life. And uh, we, uh, we used to talk about the possibility of them not coaching, and we didn't push them toward that. They just gravitated that way. Kind of hard not to. No, take us, take us just briefly, and you guys feel free to jump in. But give us that career. You talk about coaching football for 13 years, but tell everybody your your stops at the high school ranks. Um, it's it's. I'll try to keep it the right way, but it, it's kind of a brief deal. I, I try to, or, or it's, it's kind of a long deal. But uh, um, I I tried to play college football, and Josh went with us as a baby. And I was a walk on. I'd already been in college, but not played. And, uh, got there, and I was no uh, nothing but a role guy that. Uh, Held several positions in the program, and uh, it was a great program, Carson Newman University. And I became a scout for the team. I opened and closed the weight room. I uh, tried to play a couple different times. And uh, uh, Jacob was born while we were there. From there, we went to Model High School for 20 years. And uh, and at, at the time they were graduating from college, uh, we made the move. My wife and I made the move to Buford. And uh, I was at Buford eight years. Then Stevens came for two, and it was time to make some decisions. And I was Retired and uh, went to North Gwinnett for a year as an assistant. And then I went back to Rome as the head coach for four years. And then I left there in 2017, went to work for Blue Collar Basketball. And uh, I've been working with Blue Collar ever since, doing some of my own training on the side by a coach with Blue Collar and work for Sam Allen, who's a college teammate of theirs. And, and Sam's like part of the family and we're still learning, still growing. And they've been there the whole way helping me. So that's it. All right. You, you talk about uh, blue collar, what you're doing now, but we see the big blue shirt down there. Um, you had both boys on a team that you coached at Model. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yes, and, and good players. Uh, they both started on a state-ranked team. And then uh, the next year after Josh graduated, we won a region championship. Josh was on a region championship as a sophomore also. So uh, they got to be part of some success. Model was a rebuilding and – it was a great experience, a great – Jacob's there now, and he's uh, made it even better. But uh, mm -hmm. they were part of something really cool. It was, a, it was a fun time. It was a tough time. It was tough on them, I'm sure. But, it, but I, I have a lot of great memories. We'll put that uh, – this part of the podcast on loop for you, Josh and Jacob. He said you guys were both great players. There you go. <laughs> and let, let me ask you – It took 20 years. It took 20 <laughs> years, Dan. <laughs> So I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to hear that. Everybody's a legend that played yeah. with me once they get out. Mm -hmm. Once they get past me, they're a legend in my mind. Mm -hmm. Hey, even Josh, let me ask you this before we get through where y'all been. Well, in a lot of ways, Dan said that we were on the same team, but I feel like he coached us our whole life because um, you're on the side during practice. And there are stories about um, 
there's stories of his players beating us up, you know, beating us up in a relative sense, picking on us, us finding ways to get back at them. I'm not sure if we want to tell some of those stories or not. I got a good one about that now. I got a really good one. Oh, it's probably the same one I'm deciding not to tell. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I remember um, as a kid, there were certain teams that you just put on a pedestal and it was lucky. And it was Barry College and Shorter College. And it was Model High School. So, I mean, it was kind of a um, – you sat at games and cried when you lost and you went horse cheering when you won. And then uh, other days you fell asleep on the gym floor while they practiced. So, um, it felt a lot – the times leading up to us coaching felt a lot like our, – our playing for him felt a lot like uh, when we did play for him. What would you just do, Jacob? Energy conservation, number one priority here. I got okay. You. I thought you shot the lights out. <laughs> I've done that before, too. I'll, I'll check later. I thought you were checking on You got anything to add to that, Jay? Got anything to add about before you get for him? Some, some, some thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I remember under the bleachers playing basketball with those wax paper cups that they used to sell at the concession stands, playing on the door jams, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, just running around the gym. And then I would occasionally check on the score. I, I remember going home sweaty, falling asleep in the gym when mom and dad cleaned the gym too. So, you know, a little bit, a lot of romance when we look back, but uh, yeah, like Josh said, we lived it. You know, we lived it. We had, we put model basketball sweatshirts on snowmen when we built them. Mm -hmm. So that was, and that was, that was unique. I, I, I didn't realize it was unique, but we lived it. Mel, what was that story you were going to tell? Um, you know, like all coaches, I had my quirkiness about certain things had to be done certain ways. And I'm not a detailed guy on everything, but you know, if I, I'm not going to tell you which angle to take on a, on a cut. I'm going to teach it to you, but, but there are certain things I want to done. The locker room had to be clean. Uh, you know, it, it, there couldn't be any trash. Uh, players could not pee on the lid of the commode. You know, uh, you were going to, you know. Uh, That's the story you, right there. That, that, that yeah. Deep, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had a, and if one guy did something wrong, then they all, you know, we would correct it one-on-one -on -one sometimes, but if we had to, we would make the, Question by, you know, uh, punishment by the group, and they would make sure that it was taken care of. So the locker room stayed really clean. It was a refuge for the players, and that's where I wanted it to be. And uh, so I, uh, I had that locker room the way I wanted it, and it was not a great locker room from the standpoint of a lot of nice things. But uh, a couple of days in a row, I didn't get what I wanted on cleanliness around the toilet. So I, uh, I ran them. And so the second day, I ran them again. So it came a third day, and I went to run them again, and I asked them, I said, uh, are you uh, are y'all just dumb, or are you uh, are you just re refusing to uh, you know do what I ask you to do? And um, I saw these eyes peek out of the locker room door, never knowing what that was about. And one of the players held up his hand, and he said, uh, "Coach, I got something I want to tell you." And I said, "Well, before or after we run?" So well, I'll tell you before. He said, uh, "Josh and Jacob were peeing on the mode. and uh, come to find out, they were like eight, nine years old, and they were. Uh, those guys have been picking on we were, the locker room. We were retaliating. Down, you know, rough them up a little bit, throw basketballs at them, do everything the coaches keep gets done to them. So they figured out how to do paybacks. And so, so those guys, the first couple of days, took the took the running. They, you know, they took it. And uh, the third day, they got tired of it. They were ready to pay back on Josh and Jacob. So I called off the running and took care of Josh and Jacob. That's a great story, though. And you find a way for the payback. I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> well, they, they told me they learned to cuss on the back of the, the school, uh, school bus on games. And uh, they, more than one time, they got put in a ball rack in a cage, you know, where they dropped the top on you. And uh, one time I came in and couldn't find my tee. I walked through the door of the gym and didn't see anybody. And then I heard some noise and went around the corner. And when I got around the corner, there was a circle. And there was a lot of noise, and Josh and Jacob were just beating the fool out of each other, fist fighting. They were probably nine and ten again. Players were egging them on, you know. So that was life. That was that's how we lived every day. That was every day. Yeah, yeah, it was every day. <laughs> I, I would say that's for my son Logan. Other than he probably teaches my guy to curse. I would think that might be <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I don't know where he learned that, Corey. Where, where did he learn that? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so walk us through your career, Jacob, after playing for him, and we'll talk a little bit about playing for Milton. Walk us through everywhere you've been after playing. 
I was fortunate enough to be offered a, a chance to play at Reinhardt, Gerald Sharp, who y'all all know. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was 98, 99, and uh, played with all the guys, Sam Allen and TJ Rosine and all that crowd that are now in coaching. Um, finished there after four years and went to Buford as dad's assistant. I really, just being personal here, I never really thought I was going to coach. I thought I was probably going to go to seminary, even apply and didn't see coaching in my future. And then I really liked student teaching. So when dad left model, I went with him. So I, I married a girl from Waleska. <laughs> we went to Buford, got my head coaching experience, started in Adairsville in 07, 08. And then five years later, came back to my alma mater. You know, I've done a lot of things in, in basketball that I thought I wouldn't do. I swore I wouldn't do, which is probably, for me, a good indicator that I'm going to do it. Um, but... Mm-hmm. Quick tangent, why do you say, or why did you think at the time, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to follow this path? What was what was your brain telling you? Trying to break away, be independent, or what was something else going on there? No, I mean, it's it's I mean it's not as funny. It's probably more spiritual than that. Like, I really felt a calling in the ministry. So, I, I you know, I thought, and, and I still feel that. I, still, I know I'm in that form of ministry now. So that, um, and, and maybe familiarity breeds contempt or whatever that quote is that you, you think that's one way you grow up. That's not the way you're supposed to grow up next. But funny enough, 20 years later, my son's grown up that way. So, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what about you, Josh? Walk us through your path from leaving model as a player. Um, well, I played two years at Truett and you and me have talked about that a million times. And I, I uh, played for Wayne Collette where I, I can't tell you all the things I learned from him. And then I followed I followed two years up there. I actually come home for a year that is going to school at uh, what is now Georgia Highlands. I was at Floyd College for a semester. Then I was at Shorter for a semester trying to figure out what I was going to do. But I got to help my dad in in coaching. And it it was a lot less formal. I mean, I wasn't there every day, but I got to take part in some things. And then from there, um, Gerald offered me an opportunity to join Jacob at Reinhardt. And I actually originally thought I was going to go there as some, something like a student assistant or a manager and ended up playing, which tells you how <laughs> up that team was for players and <laughs> the talent that we had at the time. But, um, but played for Gerald and ended up uh, coaching there the next year as a student assistant. So playing through it, I got to play against Jacob when he was at Reinhardt. Going to Reinhardt, I got to play with him in college after playing with him in high school. <laughs> And in that final year, and I'll use this term loosely, but I got to coach Jacob. So that was a unique experience from the sibling side. But after two years coaching at Reinhardt, I went to North Georgia, stayed there for 16 years, and just wrapped up my first year as a head coach at Chester T High School, first year of high school teaching that uh, ended a few months early, obviously. <laughs> so been a unique experience the last year, needless to say. So that was a quick version. That's quick. For, hey, thanks for sharing those paths. It kind of lays the groundwork as we go forward with uh, with all the stories. What was it like? And, and you've hinted at it, both of you, playing for dad. Were you one more player or was he harder on you guys because you're going home together or is it a total separation of that's, player that's and real, son? It's that? real tough, Dan. Let me think about it for a minute. It was, uh, he was definitely tougher on us. Mm-hmm. He, he was tougher on us than anybody else bar none. And we can argue about which one of us he was tougher on, but nothing else is close. So. I I had better shot selection, so he's probably tougher on Josh. (laughs) Yeah, you should have thrown me the ball. (laughs) Hey, I've I've got a great story about that, too. (laughs) You weren't asking for it. (laughs) Typically, any shot I shot was a good one. So, I had a really good shot selection. (laughs) What do you say about that, Milt? Do what? Go ahead and give us that story. Go. Uh, senior night, Josh's senior year, he, he drops his fourth three, and it's right there at the timeline in front of the bench. I could reach out and touch him. He was standing so close. And uh, I said, no, no, no. And it drops through the net. He turns around and gives me this, I can feel it. I can feel it. And I said, I patted that bench, and I said, you're going to feel this if you're missing this. <laughs> just, just think about how much the times have changed. I hit my fourth three. And yelling at me, no. Well, he, he had five or six that night, which was a good shoot night. But, but to their credit, uh, they played with some other guys who played small college ball or were offered a chance. So there was a there was probably in the range of six, seven guys that had a chance to play at the small college mm-hmm. level. I didn't have any D one players then, 
but uh, I had some really good shooters, and uh, but I had no true two. I mean, no true uh, post player, and so we played in a, a one game motion type offense look, and uh, and the three was wide open to take, and so there might be five guys hit threes that night, you know, and it might hit two or three. So uh, so it was a it was a great shooting team. Hey, Josh, Jacob, what do you do now, though? Not your kid, but when one of your players hits the fourth three in front of the bench, are you heat checking and giving them the green light, or are you telling them to settle down? How, oh, do, you coach coach that? How do you coach that kid up? Yeah, may, maybe I'm reacting to my experience, but I'm calling that guy's number the next trip down. I'm giving him a chance to hit that fifth one, for sure. <laughs> or maybe yeah. the ninth or tenth or something like that, but I'll let him tell Corey that story when he uh, Josh had a kid hit 16 in three quarters this year. Yeah. Wow. True story. Corey, in fact, he's playing for Corey next year. I, I personally, if a kid hits four threes, I'm pretty happy too. So, but I, I, you know, it depends on what team it is. If it's a guy who you know it's straight luck, I'd probably say something to him. So, should I be offended by that? Yeah. <laughs> that That's where I was going with it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, Mill, what was it like with your sons? Did you ever have anybody from the crowd or, or the school ever say anything to you like, hey, you're favoring them or you're too Daddy hard on them? Either way. Um, this is a, a, a hour long topic in itself. And I've been asked that a lot by guys who are coaching their sons or daughters <laughs> or women who've coached their kids. But uh, yes and no, uh, never from the crowd openly to me and never to my face uh, back door type comments or uh, when they were attacking me and my coaching overall that was brought into play. And, uh, but the, the good part was I never, uh, they could question me playing them over their child if they wanted to, but they couldn't question their effort. They couldn't question their intensity. Um, two of the hardest, if not the two hardest players. And I'm gonna tell you something, this is my pride, but. I coach kids who played hard, and uh, and all four stops I've been at, and uh, some of them had to learn to, but they came into it playing hard, and it was. Uh, and I was told by their college coaches, "Your boys play hard. They play extremely hard." So, there was sometimes a question here or there, but when you got right down to it, uh, one guy said to me one night, uh, "If my if it was if my son was your son, he wouldn't be treated the way he is." And I said, "No, he probably been kicked off a long time ago." And uh, the dad didn't like that, and, but he got quiet and left me alone. Did, did you guys ever hear anything that, like, where you had to take up for dad? Maybe you had to put on your son pants for a minute and say, hey, man, don't talk about pops like that? Or or was that not really the case? No. I think I got a story about that one, too. <laughs> I, occasionally, I occasionally heard that. I had, a, I had a couple of good friends that didn't get to play as much. And so that made it awkward. Or dad had to cut some of our friends. So that made it awkward, but I mean, I, I had one time that I, a guy made a comment to me after a game, I wish your dad would give me more of a chance. And I said, well, you know, you're not very good at practice. So I'm not real sure why, you know, that comes, that goes back to your philosophy on how you treat friends at practice and games, right? I mean, I have teammates out there. I don't want to be friends with everybody. So. Yeah. The, the great question is um, our practices were full, full tilt, get after you. And uh, we could, we can embellish it, but I don't think anything we say is an embellishment. We had to pull kids off each other because we went so hard. We uh, we didn't have to have special loose ball drills because every every possession was a loose ball drill, and mm -hmm. it became a way of life. And they were part of that as children watching it. So when they came into the program, they naturally that was part of their persona. And so it was fun. It, it, looking back, uh, the head coach at Pepper High School was there with them. He was a good scorer too. He went on and played small college football and played a little bit of basketball at Maryville College. And, he recently was on the radio and he said <laughs> it was a war. Every day was a war. And he said, and today I appreciate it, you know. So there's a lot of stuff to be said about all that. You just answered most of what my next question was, but fill us in on this. How do you get players to play hard? And, and you describe it's full tilt in practice. What do you do with that kid who's not getting after it? Um, do you cut them? Do you encourage them? Do you put them in competitive situations? So what, what's the strategy there for the coaches listening to get everybody to get after it? All those things you mentioned, but there has to be an emphasis and intensity in who you are. And it doesn't have to be a vocal. I am a vocal person. I'm out, uh, outwardly in the middle of battle really tough as far as vocally or getting after people. But 
it, it, it has to be the intensity they believe that you bring, that you believe in what you're doing, but I think that they have to buy into each other. And one of the, one of the best things I ever had happen, I was at Model High School and they had graduated and I mean, it was summer practice. I had a, a senior to be a role player turn around to a young kid and said, hey, that next loose ball, you better be on it, boy, because he said, I'm not running for you. He said, uh, we, don't, we don't stand and watch here. He said, we get after it. And he said, nobody's going nobody's to take the heat for you. So it started being passed along. So once you build that tradition, it's passed along. But building that tradition is tough. And it's happened to other places I've been. They've got it in their programs. Their programs play hard. And so whatever I did right, they emulated and done better with it or they embraced it. And, uh, but I believed I wasn't a great player. And uh, I believed and grew up playing that way. And uh, I think it's a great game now. I'm an old football coach and played a little bit. And uh, I believe football is a great game. It teaches you how to get when you get knocked down. And Jacob's son and I just had this conversation on his way to football practice that, today. But uh, I think basketball is a great game for understanding you can be lesser talented and play extremely hard and play, make right decisions and beat people or take them to the wire. And I think Corey's teams are, emul you know, emulate that too. Mm -hmm. and you beat me three times one year when I thought I might be able to beat you. I beat you. No, I beat you one time that year. And you beat me once. I, uh, you beat me twice. And I beat you once. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Josh, going into year two, we're talking about building that kind of mentality and it takes some time. How are you doing it at Chesity to get those players to play hard? I hear a lot of people ask that question of other coaches and I think about it and um, there may be a formula. Like there may be a way to put on paper how to do that. Uh, Jacob probably has a great way to articulate that because Jacob can always say things that I think and I can't figure out how to say. But when I think about the guys that I played for or I think about coaching kids that played for Corey, like, like later on, but I really think about playing for my dad from the early days or being a kid watching him, every team I've ever seen, the head coach's personality comes out. Mm -hmm how they play, how they practice, how they approach it. Doesn't matter what uh, quote you write on the wall or what you write on a piece of paper, the head coach's personality comes out. So the guys that I've been with since my dad, they had great things that came out through it, but I think there's something, whether it's genetic, whether it's us watching those model practices all those years, I think it's what I value most. most. There's things we work on that, that my dad never worked on. There's things he worked on that we don't, but at the end of the day, it's what you value and your players know what you value. Yeah, what you celebrate, what you discourage, conversations you have away from it, um, they, they know what you value and who you put on the floor based on those values. So, Dan, I don't know. I hope it's working. I feel like it's working. I hope it keeps going, but I feel like that's my personality coming out. In the, and there's probably some things that, that aren't good in our program from that too, but I hope that's not the case. And you, but you've committed to it. It's who you are. It's who your program is going to be. That's well, well, can't standing. fake it can't be anybody else. If you're going to be who you are and you're going to be genuine and you're going to be the best coach you can be, you got to be yourself. And, I, and I've been around other guys that I played with and coached with that decided they wanted to be something they weren't. It never worked. you got, you got to be who you are and sell out to it and go all out. And, and that's my Corey talking about you. I was telling a story today about one of your earliest practices and you handed us a practice plan that was three hours long and there was 30 minutes of offense on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's who you were. And those guys that were never in a situation defensively, they didn't know what to do, you know? So I think you got to be who you are at the end of the day. And that's, that's what dad did. And that's what I feel like I'm doing. So, and I know that's what Jacob's doing too. So yeah, well, you, you didn't need Jacob to put those words in your mouth that time. That was pretty well said. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> lucky, just lucky. Hey, and uh, how mad was Chris Faulkner when he left that practice? Well, I don't know if I've ever told you this story, and that's a great place to do it, okay? But Chris looked beside me, and he pulls up a sheet of paper, and he looks at it, and he, like, hits me, and he goes, Josh, this practice is three hours long. I was like, okay. He goes, I think there's only, like, 30 minutes of offense. Have I told you this story? Uh -uh. He goes, man, he goes, just call me when they get to the offense. And he jumped up and went out to his truck for a minute and made a phone call or something. I don't know what he did, but the last thing he wanted to see was – guys taking charges or switching on screens or any just just wasn't what he wanted to do so back up and tell us tell our, our listeners the rest of that story Faulkner you in the gym with Corey what were you doing there um well shoot man that that was one day but there was a lot of days and it was okay. days in the summer that uh it, Tallahassee used to have a juco jamboree that on the way down to that we'd go to Waycross maybe on the way back um 
tried to come down once or twice a year for a game. It was a long drive, and that hour between Tifton and Waycross, man, I don't know how I didn't get a ticket, but I did. <laughs> I'll Most probably get 70 miles on earth, my wife. Oh, it's, it's terrible. And I'll probably get a ticket now if Brent never gets to play for you, which I think he will, man. And I drive and I see those like, yeah. and I, I'm be scared to death. I'm going to get a ticket those nights too. But um, we were down there a ton and got we're to watch practices, a lot of games. Um, you know, he ended up coaching some guys that played for Corey, both there and Truett. That's what I was going to say. It started <laughs> when the ride yeah, was a lot closer. It was a lot easier trip. That yeah, was a lot yeah. easier trip. Yeah, but, mountain uh, roads. Yeah, but you sit down and you have your recruiting board and you list your players and what you need. We knew what we would get from Waycross. And I could call Corey, or a lot of times that first call was to DJ and say, because <laughs> because Corey would send me an email and tell me a six four guy was six seven and you know something like that. <laughs> I call DJ and say, and, and this is my favorite one, man. And I haven't come up with this for here yet, but my favorite one is I call DJ and go, "Is that guy a swamp fox?" Like that was my favorite thing, just that little box that y'all had checked off. This guy's a swamp fox. This guy, eh, he's not a swamp fox yet, but he will be. So, <laughs> we're getting it for sure. I like it. I like it. Hi, right, right, Jacob. Tell, tell us how, how you, you feel like you get that extra effort of, of hard work from your group. You know, I we uh, we went back and adopted. Josh and I talk about this. He had mentioned swamp fox before. We adopted poor hungry dog, just something dad coined years ago at Model. Um, and I was started at Adairsville, got to coach some great athletes, tried to change the culture and had teams that were better. And, you know, you end up – coaches are the worst about putting stuff on the wall and T-shirts and not getting it off the wall and using it real well. So um, we started saying Ph.D. for Poor Hungry Dog. I think it was Patino years ago that had, like, passion, hunger, drive, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started saying Ph.D., get your Ph.D. for your Poor Hungry Dog. And um, – the biggest thing is we played really hard in high school. We were very emotional. Um, I, I assumed this is going to sound kind of crazy, but I assumed that most people could kick that gear in. And I started realizing, I think we were raised that way. We were raised by my, my dad's not the only intense person at our house. Um, I don't think he really ever won the conversations. He thought he won, but like, <laughs> like poor hungry dog is, like we were taught you work that way you went to school that way you went to church that way you were all in all in all in so it was a process I was a head coach in 07 08 I was 27 at Adairsville and I owed him some probably some time and money I don't think it did a great job but it took me a while to realize like the most important word to being a poor hungry dog is not yet you know like instead of saying he is one or he isn't one like Josh just quoted uh maybe he's not one yet so you know, having a standard doesn't mean that everybody's meeting that standard all the time. So that's been the biggest growth. We, it's nurture in nature. We were nurtured that direction. So other personalities coming in the room now and kids grow up in different ways. Maybe they grow up with the grandparents who are quieter or even louder sometimes. I mean, I, I've learned to get kids to play hard it means you really got to build that relationship really, really, really strong so that when you're hard on them, harsh with them, telling them truth, maybe telling them truth really loud, uh, that they, man, they don't just turn and quit on you. So that's been the hardest thing is to learn how to build that relationship really solid because I, that's what dad did. And dad's teams were known for, for playing hard, but I always remind people, like I got an assistant coach that played one of our rivals at Coosa and he talks about how dirty we were. And I was like, yeah, but I still shot better than you too. You know, mm -hmm. so I have to occasionally remind them that, you know, we, we played really hard, but dad didn't sacrifice on the fundamentals. We could shoot, we could shoot the lights out and, and all that too. So, um, anyway, that's – it's a journey trying to get kids to play hard. And every generation – every five years, I think kids are changing. Let's talk about what you said there, the not yet, and giving up on a kid or a kid who's not playing hard the first couple practices. How do you give them that little extra time in your own head? How do you give yourself time to say, let me give this kid a chance or there is some potential because it's easy to quit on a kid if they're not meeting those expectations, as you referred to. How do all three of you kind of – get the not yet in your head and apply it. Me first? Yes, sir. Hey. Um, I, I just had this conversation with a high school coach yesterday. I, I get to talk to high school coaches every day or all every week and high school players. I'm a school interventionist now for Floyd County. It was about a kid that's on my caseload that's a player. And uh, um, as long as that kid is not hurting everybody else, I think you stay with that kid. 
I would rather err on the fact of people saying to me, uh, you messed up, that kid burnt you. I'd rather have him burn me than me overlook him and not help him. Mm. And I don't mean just as a player. And that goes back to the why. You know, you asked about the why before we got on here. And the why is, is to make people better people, better players. And, uh, and so if we can hang with a kid, and I, I, I think they do the same thing, but we can hang with a kid and it's not slowing down the progress of the program and everybody else, then you hang with that kid. Now, sometimes there's a balance in between that where you have to remove that kid and then you still hang with him as a person. And then sometimes you have to completely separate yourself from that kid. And, um, and that's, a, that's a, sometimes an art. Sometimes it's a crap shoot. Sometimes it's a – but your heart's got to win. You know, I think relationships are so important in, in coaching business, no matter what sport it is. And I think if you care about kids – that you win at that, that battle more than you lose. And I think sometimes you don't win it till they're done and gone away from you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's nothing better than to know that one's made it later on. That you didn't, you know, that everybody else said, nah, he ain't gonna make it. You know, he don't be nobody. And you see them, they're somebody, you know. So that's my, that's my thoughts. Well, a lot of times the, the, the problem with people is everybody wants to end, but it really doesn't end until it ends. So sometimes to correct a, a kid is not, by 10th grade or by 12th grade or by third year of college. Sometimes it might be after he's had his second kid, he looks back and realizes, man, Coach Travis was right on this, 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 and this. And then you technically you won. It was just a longer battle than you wanted. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I've got – being old, i got stories about that that you guys will enjoy down the road that you'll have those stories, you know. Mm-hmm. So. That's neat. Do, do you guys – Work, you know, me knowing your dad, I know how much he cares about his players. Is is that something? I mean, I'm sure you you saw as a player and and et cetera. But is that something that you've inherited yourself, or is that something you kind of try to judge when you're dealing with a kid? You think back to your dad, or how does that kind of work? Jacob, you go first. We went with Josh last time. I I don't know if it's um, I don't think it's inherited. And I, I coached with dad five years as his assistant at Buford. So I learned. Hey, 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 time out right here now. Time out. Uh, no no story about the hallway uh, in between games and that, that kid that, you know, I had to put against the wall or anything, okay? Dad, you can't call as many timeouts as you're going to need to protect yourself, <laughs> all right? <laughs> There's only five. That's, of, okay. that's only the five first, ever, first ever podcast timeout. <laughs> <laughs> If it's a pickup game, y'all, he just calls a foul when it's not one. This is that's his first <laughs> timeout. But never I never been I, stopped in the post by my sons. Never been stopped in the post. Yep. Uh-oh. <laughs> just get stopped by the rim. Yeah, I was gonna say, do you still make the shot though? <laughs> is the ball going in. I I uh I don't think you I don't think you can I think that's a big nurture thing, but having that experience with dad or other coaches we've learned from, especially, but you know, that's one of the things I just can't tolerate is when a coach is this is gonna sound bad, but when a coach is really they're gonna they're gonna pretend they have a high standard and they mask it, and it's really just laziness. You know, when they say, I'm not dealing with kids like that this year, that drives me up the wall. I'm like, you don't want to deal with kids like that ever, you know, because you really don't want to coach. So I <laughs> The biggest, the biggest thing is, uh, you know, being curious before you're furious. You know, I've learned that over the years. Try to figure out what's going on with that kid. I think that's a fair criticism to say that maybe we all, I know for dad, we, we hang with kids too long. Or we give kids too many chances. I still think Pete Carell was uh, his book, Smart Take from the Strong or whatever it was, talked about in his book about, you know, regret and kicking a kid off the team. So, to me, that, that's like the, the last thing I want to do. Um, and I, I'd be curious, Corey's a junior college coach. I think everybody's a junior college coach now. I think everybody's got their kids one, two, or three years. I, I coach high school kids, and people are transferring in, and the feedback loop used to be like this. Now it's tiny, and the relationship time is tiny. And so I think hanging with kids a little bit longer used to be you knew the kid growing up, and you saw him coming. And I've noticed in the last few years, you don't, you don't get that chance to really build all that. So you kind of have to decide if it's, you know, if it's too late. But I think it's never too late for a kid to start being a charge taker. You know, it's never too late for a kid to, to grow into that role. So Neither does Corey. <laughs> right. Let's go. I like it. I like it. Anytime we compare something to a charge is good. Right. Hey, hey but Milt, 
How about that little statement? Curious before furious. I'm not taking scribbling crazy notes over here. We're I think that's Urban Meyer. I think that's I, I met Corey after they didn't get a charge call against Georgia Highlands one year. I'd never met Corey or seen his team play. Maybe the second or third year, Georgia Highlands just, you know, they showed up with all those players. Corey, you grandstanded the whole game. You went to the free throw line in front of your bench at Georgia Highlands gym. <laughs> And you went off. You went off, on some, you went off on these referees, and I was like, "This guy's really my hero." Um, and I called Josh later and said, "How did he get away with that?" And Josh goes, "He's like the veteran in that league. You got to remember, man. He's invested a lot into that. <laughs> into that. The, Is he taking the charge up on the sideline?" <laughs> yeah. I think. Uh, I think it's long, a couple of things. One, uh, we take so many. I do still believe that refs have a number. You know how they have the ticker yep. and, and umpires? Yep. <laughs> but when I, I think they have a number, and when they get to that number on charges, they don't call them no more no matter what. Yep. I, I can't prove that, but I believe that. And I, I, give, them hard, <laughs> I give them a hard time about that. But, I, you know, I'm usually pretty calm guy on the sideline, wouldn't you wouldn't all say? <laughs> you have gone down. Yeah, I have. I'm definitely you were calm. crazier. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny is I was crazier when I was at a Baptist college. I sat behind you one time when you were at Truett, and you jumped and did a 360 on a call one time. You jumped and spun in the air and landed and like untucked and reached the shirt. It was amazing. Yeah, I probably couldn't do that now. What, 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 what <laughs> one of the best moves? Let's, let's jump to that just because you're mentioning it. All three of you, what's the best move you've made reacting to a call or a player's um, – action on the court. You just described Corey's. I know I did a burpee coaching the Emory JV team at LaGrange. Uh, <laughs> I was so fired up about them executing the play. Um, how about the, the three of you, Travis coaches? I'll defer to them. I'll let them talk about their moves first. The only thing I can think of, Dan, didn't happen this year. I was an assistant JV coach at Reinhardt. And we actually – I can't even remember who we beat. I think it was the Oxford Emory team. But we won like two games the whole year. And the head coach of that JV team is TJ Rosine. It's now at Emmanuel. And TJ turned to walk down the bench like towards the end of the game. We hit a shot. And I did one of these fist bumps like this. And I punched TJ right in the small of the back. <laughs> he got down to his knees, jumps up and yells at me. Um, I wouldn't go back and do it again. I didn't do it on purpose then, but man, that that's probably the funniest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. That's good. Like right in the kidney, just nailed him. Well, you know, I coached in a game against uh, Chris Faulkner and Josh Travis. I was an assistant where it had to be the most technicals in the history of college basketball. Yeah, and, that, and I, I still don't think that guy's ever refed in the Peach Belt again, has he? I, I have no idea, but I know, I think you got a technical that game. No, I did not. And everybody thinks I did, but I had to escort one of our players to the. I've gotten a technical as an assistant coach now. I'm not, no, none of that. You're not hiding from that. To escort a guy <laughs> to the locker room. So, anyway. That was one of the all time best. I still remember that today. They got really about eight or nine technicals in a row. Am I exaggerating? No, but it was um, two for Matt Causey, two for Mark Causey, two for Buzz Weehunt, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, those are some those are some guys that have, that have done that before. They would be happy to hear this story being told about them. In that you, you coach Matt Causey up there? I don't know if anybody's ever coached Matt Causey. Let's okay, just, that's a good point because I I, um, I, I, he, I was on the same bench with him for a couple summers with the Georgia Stars. So <laughs> that was um, I, this kind of wraps back to some other things we talked about, like being who you are and intensity and all these other kind of things and. I was a young assistant who felt like I had too much emotion and mm -hmm. I did. I didn't know how to channel some of that. And Matt was a guy who would suddenly turn to me when I showed it, he would be like, where the hell's that been? We need more of that. Like that's, that's what this team needs. And it was validating in a way to have one of your players do that because you know, you were helping him be better. And it typically calmed him down, focused him. Um, but Matt was, uh, I wish I had a Matt Causey on every team I ever coached. I believe but, it. But at the same time, and Mark, Mark was that as well. But mm -hmm. that, you never had to make a drill competitive. You went into every practice going, we need to not make this competitive because it might blow up <laughs> the face. So we literally called it causey proofing. Like every practice plan, 
we would quasi proof it to make sure our practice didn't blow up. Quasi proofing, as it's going on my notes. So yeah. I love it. <laughs> For those well, who know that, <laughs> they were with us our first year in D2, but also our last year in NAI. And that, relative to the level, that NAI team was probably the best team I've ever coached. For sure. Mm -hmm. Pretty special. So, all Jacob, right. You do any backflips on the sidelines or uh, any uh, 360s that come I to have. Mind? Uh, I, I probably set some records for sub varsity games when I was an assistant at Buford. I coached the JV and the freshman team. I'm not sure how many technicals I got that year. Um, it was bad. I've ripped a bunch of pants, man. I mean, I, I just think that's my go to. The kind of SpongeBob material. So that was kind of the fine for the technicals back then was the ripped pants. Now they actually fine high school coaches, right? In oh Georgia. yeah, it's like it's like two fifty. For, for an ejection. Huh? Oh, yeah, for an ejection. Uh, yeah. Now, I was ejected from a JV game for putting my hands in my pocket after the first technical. I, I was there. The guy, <laughs> I was the guy tosses me. I will never forget. I've never been ejected. One time I was ejected, and I will never forget. I, I met with the guy afterwards. He explained to me why he got him for putting his hands in his pocket. The answer was, you never know when a man puts his hands in his pocket what he's going to pull out. <laughs> That's what the referee told me. Oh man, that's classic. Usually, yeah, like, so good. ejecting him is a good anybody. move. Ejecting him really protects yourself. Yeah. But I, I've earned more technicals than I've received. I've earned a lot more than I've received. And that the best thing is once Corey, you know, you, you've invested a lot into it. Once people get to know who you are, it's kind of like, eh, they kind of put up with you being an idiot on the sideline a little bit before they give you one. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Well, it works for me. Yeah, I think so. Jacob goes to the Dares one. He gets told. In a game, uh, after he complains to the official, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And uh, he's living over that. I call the referee association about it. I'm in Buford. I call referee association. I knew a guy. And I said, hey, you know what? The boy shouldn't have to live for his dad, you know, live for his dad's mistakes. Don't, don't let me hear that, you know. And they took care of it. The referee association took care of it. And the guy was a good guy, really, but he shouldn't have said that. Hey, uh, Milt, tell, tell the – people listening here uh, a little bit about the breakfast club. I know that was a big thing at uh, Buford. Uh, the breakfast club, the name came from Gene Durden, who has made it his, one of his fortes for years. And uh, he did it at Dade and then at Buford. Uh, Jacob came to me. He was one of the ones that started for us at Buford. We had never done the morning workouts in the summertime. We'd have practices and played and played probably more than we practiced. And Jacob said, hey, we need some skill development. How about let's take Coach Durden. Gene was still at Dade. Let's let's take his and fit and fit it for us. And so we, um, the first year, I think Jake can correct me on this. We did the boys and girls. We did the girls coach was all in Denise Swanson. And so Jake I, we did that for two summers, yeah. two long summers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, uh, he did both. And, uh, then we, uh, then Denise got out and Gene came and did his own and we continued to do it. And ours had to be modified because football was such a strong thing. And we had so many kids playing football. We didn't go, Gene went four or five days a week. We would go three, I think three days a week. And, and then we would build around playing. It was fundamental development. That's what it was aimed at, an hour each morning. And that's what it was about, was fundamental development. Now we would sometimes stack on the end of it afterwards, three on three playing or something like that. But it was about learning how to chin the ball. It was about making a better outlet pass. It was about, um, you know, catching the ball into a jump stop or catching the ball in a one-two footwork. You know, it was, it was a lot of precise stuff that we were trying to build into our kids. And um, we realized that certain groups don't have as much fundamental background. And Gene had done a great job. Of, ha, every one of his teams has always been fundamental. And so uh, we adopted it. And I was never able to do it again after that because the next two programs I took over, transportation was such an issue in the morning. So our practices kind of included the breakfast club idea. But at Buford, we did it. We did it. Now, get this. These kids that were playing football, 20 out of the 33 kids, they would come in at seven in the morning in the summertime and go from seven to eight, and then they'd go do the football. And it, it, uh, that's it was yeah. I think what was just as big as that was uh, Big Blue Camp. Yeah. And Jacob, is that a camp shirt you're wearing right now? Yep. When we were kids, how old were we when you started Big Blue Camp, man? You were too young to come because we didn't take sixth graders then. I mean, six year olds then. So y'all were like five right. or six. Corey, he started a camp. I think he had like 12 kids at it. And it's similar. 15, 15, you yeah. still call it Baldwin's Ballers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's a similar concept to that, but he started it when we were kids. And I, I, am I right in saying 12 kids total? 15 kids. 
15 kids and now they run it um jacob's doing it now at the same school I mean, y'all are having 150 kids at camp wow our numbers uh, like two two summers ago jacob and them had uh between the girls and boys uh girls coach sally eccles and jacob they had 425 to 450 kids wow. but you're talking about something that we grew up in you get the fundamentals that we're talking about we didn't have a breakfast club we had that camp a couple times a summer mm -hmm. All these guys came in on Sunday afternoons and played pickup, us included, and there was two courts. There was the, the guys that have gone off to college and come back home, and then there's the younger kids on the other end. I like so in those fundamentals, competing, trying to get yourself on the big court, trying to win and stay, and I wasn't at Buford for the breakfast club, so I'm probably not the right guy to say this, but I want to pump Big Blue in that regard because that yeah. was something I think made everybody at Model the players they were. It's a 35, I think it's 35 years. This year we did an online version, got a guy that grew up in it to do a YouTube channel for us. And uh, I think we, I, I may be wrong on the numbers because you know how those numbers are like fish, they grow. But I think it was 244 two summers ago. That's boys only. Yeah. The girls ran, that's one week. But we have four gyms now and you got Milt Travis running your oldest kid. I mean, I come in every summer and see Milt Travis making some sixth grader, I don't know, cry. All right. He, no, that's not fair. And he's Frozen push up, yes, but not cry. That'll come back. To, you know that'll come back to me later. Is he okay? You think I kind of got after him? <laughs> and then, uh, and we, but we have four different gyms rolling on our campus, so it's a, it's really a, an awesome experience that you can have four separate real camps, and you get all of them back together for speakers. And but that's thirty years worth of, um, thirty five years worth of investment in it, and then. We've really made a big push lately to make sure all four of the camps are good. So you're really having four separate camps, four different gyms. It gets too big, man. Some kids aren't getting good experiences and aren't really growing or getting held accountable, or, you know, getting that, that personal touch. So we, we've really put a lot of work into it. It's not just a babysitting operation. You're actually working on the basketball. I love it. I love it. Listen, before we get into our kind of our, our lightning round, our quick hitters here at the end, um, We've got three members of the Travis team on this podcast, but who really makes this go? Who else are we missing that's not on camera right now, Mel? You mentioned it. Who got you set up on camera today? <laughs> you well, to talk about and share. Years ago, I, I worked for a man that was a, uh, a good principal, but he'd been an excellent coach, a state championship football coach and a very successful high school basketball coach. And, he said to me one day, you're going to make it in this business. And I said, I thought he was getting ready to tell me how smart I was. I was really excited because I wanted that approval. I was 29 years old. I said, you think so? And he said, yes, sir. He said, your wife, your wife is a coach's wife. And your kids love what you do. And so he was right. Uh, my wife's invested. She invested in the big blue camp. She invested in her children. Um, the year we left model, uh, the boys were playing college basketball. And uh, no, it was two years before that because Josh was still at Truett, maybe. I can't remember. Our daughter, Sarah, was playing high school ball. I was coaching. And so in, she had kidney stones. And in 30 days, she saw 30 games and went through several kidney stone procedures. And uh, the doctor looked at me and he said, toughest person I know. <laughs> I said, well, we know that in the house. She takes care of it all, you know. So very fiery, very competitive, just retired from teaching, loves children. Uh, has really gone through the grieving process of leaving the education field in the last couple of days with school starting back. But uh, she's behind the scenes, our daughter. Uh, my daughter played four years of high school basketball. She was on the bench and uh, played in the game as a high school freshman or sophomore uh, the night Buford beat Christy Thomas, who's a friend of mine now, uh, in the Sweet 16 to go to the lead eight. She was all, she's always been competitive. Didn't spend as much time in the game as the boys, but loved it. Love, love the game. And uh, so we got behind the scenes. They got wives that love it. They got our, mm -hmm. our grandkids. There's six grandkids. And basketball's become a theme. Uh, me and the boys are called the basketball mafia when we go to the beach because we'll wade out in the water and get up to about the neck and talk basketball. And one of the, grand, one of the uh, daughter in laws calls it the basketball mafia. It looks like we're playing the hit with somebody. Dad's, dad's usually on a float. <laughs> Good for him. He's earned that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <All> you. Right. <laughs> All right, well, let's let's go into our lightning round. Here's how we do it. Me and Sir will ask two or three or four questions apiece to you guys and uh, try to give us the uh, the abbreviated answer uh, unless it's just a great story and then run with it. But uh, I'll start us off. I'm always a foodie on here. 
So I'm gonna go uh, best place to eat in Dahlonega, Josh. Uh, if we're going to lunch, we're going to Foothills. If we're if you're visiting, we're going to Shenanigans. That's wow. Shenanigans is where I always took Jacob when he came up there hiking. But there's a place called Foothills. You had Ty on here a couple of weeks ago. Me and Ty would eat lunch there three or four days a week. It wasn't good for either one of us though. All so. right, and and Jacob, Rome. Where are you uh, taking us when we come through Rome? Classic is Schroeder's. There's, there's a – but Jerusalem Grill, Mediterranean food. When I say Mediterranean food, it's just really a Philly cheesesteak. But Jerusalem Grill. Different bread. All right. <laughs> All right, Milt, what about you? What, what, I know you, you've been around a little bit, so I'm going to go over in the uh, Buford area. I know since we already had the Rome. So where, where was your favorite place to eat in Buford? They got Zaxby's everywhere. <laughs> Kroger. That's what I was going to say. Kroger. <laughs> would it be, would um, it be Zaxby's? Uh, you know, Buford has got – it's ever-changing. So probably the Mexican restaurants in Buford are all good. But uh, I, was, I was hoping I would get the Rome deal because I don't know of a town that has more good eating places than Rome. I mean, it's, all right, well, give me one in Rome then. Give me one in Rome. Well, he named Schroeder's, but uh, there's a place called uh, 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 Harvest Moon. There's uh, I just ate at a place the other day called Jamwich. Um, there's uh, Doug's Deli. They're all great. I mean, Rome's a college town. Um, you might go in Schroeder's and run into Lenny Acuff, who now coaches at Lipscomb, who's come through Rome, Georgia, just to eat at Schroeder's. You know, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a neat place. So there's a lot of good places. All right, I, I've got. I'm gonna go two more, sir, and then I'll give it to you. Do you go eat for each of you, shorter or berry? You're in Rome, right there. Shorter or berry? If you had to pick one. Shorter girls coach is close to me, but uh, I'm close to both coaches at Berry. And uh, my wife went there, and I work out out there, so I'm around the program all the time. Peter Dees, you remember Peter Dees? Yeah, yeah. Old Berry, old Berry coach was definitely a mentor of mine. Yeah, I was around the program. Even though I, I, I like a lot of the people, it's shorter. I, I'm a very guy as far as just following the coaches. What about you guys, Josh? I was going to say Peter Dees and Coach Acuff meant a lot to me. So there was, I mean, there was good guys at shorter too. But we ended up, we ended up spending a lot of time in Ford Gymnasium playing pickup ball with college guys when we were high school kids. Mm -hmm. It's hard to put a value on that and what that did for you as a, a player and just growing up. So you got to go, Barry. You, Jake. Oh, big time. But plus, uh, for some reason, I've never liked shorter. I can't put my finger on that. I don't know if it's – I don't know what it is. You, you know, uh, one of my good friends is Ricky Williams, who's a, who was my real estate agent in Rome, who was the coach at shorter. And we talk about – he played at Barry. Uh, Gene Durden's assistant at uh, Buford, Jeff Osmond, uh, followed me at Model High School and students out with me. He was a Barry guy. You know, there, there's a lot of connections that play it's shorter. hard to separate. Yeah, Coach Coach Acuff played it shorter, but that's – Coach Acuff deserves a lot of credit in that short window of time he was there. My assistant coach played there. We got uh, one of our players' dad's the coach at Barry now. So, it seems to be we're in Barry, the Barry circle more. Yeah. All right, la last one. Uh, you guys have moved around a lot with coaching. I mean, obviously. What's the, what's the hardest part about that move? I think that's something that, that people don't know that aren't in coaching. You guys, you know, add it. I'm, I'm not good at it. I've been doing it longer than any of you guys, and I've been four places, and I'm not good to change. I, I, I love the people I'm always with, and when I have to leave them, I, I still grieve over the kids I left at Rome. Mm -hmm. And when I left uh, Model to go to Buford, I, I, it liked to kill me. And uh, Buford was good to me. But uh, and then uh, Stevens County, I was only there two years, but I still can walk in Walmart at Stevens County and get a hug from somebody because – the relationship deal. So I, I don't have any secrets on how you move because I, I'm, I have two houses. I have a house in Buford and a house in Rome. And, I, and I'm going, you know, I, I can't decide where I'm going to live and when I'm going to sell and when I'm going to be when I grow up. You really need about four houses. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> All right, Cyril, your turn for the quick hitters. All right. On the basketball track, give me a name. Um, who is better with the drop staff and half hook of the three of you. Who, got <laughs> no who, doubt. who put you up to this question? Um, <laughs> it's the only move I have, so I figured it might be appropriate here. Well, you you and Milt will love talking about this later on then. So. Qualifier. Do, 
are you calling your own foul? Is there lane violations? <laughs> and can you call a walk? I tried for ages playing pickup ball to get the defense to call foul. Nobody went for it. Nobody went for it. Nobody uh, called it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give it to dad. He needs something. <laughs> <laughs> um, years ago, I'm teaching the flip hook, and my assistant coach, who went on and became an excellent educator, says there's only one kid in the gym that's got the flip hook. And I said, where is he? I said, I haven't seen it yet. And he goes, look at the other end. Jacob was 11 years old. He was flip hooking with his left hand. Both boys could do it. And uh, I spent time, I, I'm training some middle school kids right now. I spent time with Jacob's son and a bunch of young guys the other day teaching the, the flip hook off of the, the spin move. So I don't know where you came up with that. I didn't put Dan up to that. But Sam Allen thinks it's funny that I bring it up. I, I'll send him clips of the flip hook. Sam Allen, okay, that, that maybe that's an offline conversation, but I was just texting him about working with my 12-year-old, so we'll see. Uh, well, <laughs> I work for Sam and Sam's family, and, uh, and he, uh, I mean, we can't have a conversation unless it's a half hour to an hour. And we discuss everything from religion to raising children to basketball, and Sam thinks that it's great that I love the flip hook and that I, I'm willing to incorporate his poop move or his uh, sweep over move and add a flip hook to it, so. There you go, Jacob, you agree too? Your dad's got the best flip hook. <clears throat> sure. No, it's, it's a lie. It's definitely Jacob. Jacob was in college doing that, spinning it. He would shoot it and put English on it off the backboard. So. Got to be amphibious to do that kind of stuff, though. <laughs> no, it's called being a six-foot-one post player. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Jacob, Jacob was gifted at it. Sam says that Jacob was gifted at the sweep over and bringing the ball low. He said Jacob could sweep over past big guys and quick guys just because he would attack you at the right angle and that kind of stuff. He could take the flip hook off that, and you couldn't block it. So, I, I did not think we'd go this deep into flip hooks. But personally, <laughs> I love it. I haven't even started. Hey, Playgrounds, <laughs> Frankfort, Kentucky, 1960s was where my I, began. I warned you. Oh, we're out of time. Here we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, this may tie right into that comment there, Milt. But next one, toss out, especially with the NBA now back. Uh, hopefully, we'll have our high school season, but who knows. Who was your favorite player growing up? It could be at any level, the pro or a, a model high school player. Who was your favorite player when you were growing up? Start with, uh, start with Milt this time. Uh, it began with my cousin, who was in my influence in basketball. He was a 5'7 guard that could get his hand on the rim, and he had a kind of a mean step about him. But uh, then he gravitated to the Kentucky players, Dan Issel. Then it went from there to John Havlicek. I love John Havlicek, Dave Cowens. And then I became a Larry Bird guy. But I, I supremely believe that Michael Jordan's the greatest player to ever live. So. All right. Josh. Oh, wow. Kenny Walker, Rex Chapman, Jamal Mashburn. There's a theme there you can probably pick out. Uh, Jermaine Spivey, who played at model. Everybody else after that was a model player. So, okay. uh, or that's not true. There was a couple of East Strong players in there as well. Um, but, but, you know, mainly those guys. And then as I got a little bit older, uh, Charlie Maddox, who played at Barry College, is a funny one for me to talk about. But just different guys like that that I idolized, tried to emulate, which didn't work out well because I'm five foot nine. But um, it's a long list. So Rex Chapman, got to be the winner. All right. Jacob, how about you? Favorite huge, player growing up? Huge Barkley fan when I had to play in the post a lot. Um, and the, and that back story was I was a chubby kid. So, you know, I had to go somewhere. Um, and, and that was uh, – I love shooting. But Charles Barkley, post moves, Jamal Mashburn, you know, anybody that played during that era for Kentucky, those kind of guys, just scrappy, back to the basket, but guys who could shoot too. I just loved anybody that had a lot of skill. I love this. Listen, Corey's been bugging me. He said, we've got to get the Travis crew on this podcast. Um, and no, we coach against each other. Josh, um, mm -hmm. Jacob didn't know you guys, but just listening to this interaction here today has been, it's been pretty special. So Corey, I get it. Plus they seem to love you and your style of play, which is also some points, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we would, we've adopted Corey. He's an unofficial one of us. He's just got to lose some more hair. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the, he's on the way. He, and he can get that goatee going pretty fast too, right, Corey? Hey, Dan, Dan, can I ask you one question before you do your last one? Yes, sir. One of the first podcasts you talked about being with the Emory JV team and beating Reinhardt. Mm -hmm. What year was that? God, I hope I didn't play. 
<laughs> I was going to say, when you mentioned Gerald Sharp and all of that, I'm trying to go back. It was, it was in two year world and that was, uh, it, it, 95, 96 or 96, 97. It was 96, 97 or something because they still talked about it when I got there and played a year at Juco. Oh, I love it. I, now you're I remember music. TJ telling us, I played one year of junior college and three years of NAI there. And I remember somebody walking in Emory's gym. We're playing the JV team saying, don't lose these guys because the team and such and such lost to them and Oglethorpe. Yeah. Um, and, and who's the guy that went to Oglethorpe, Chris? A big guy. Wall, maybe, or something. Yeah, Chris never Wall. Knew him. Chris Wall. Yeah. He was so good there. Yeah. So good at Reinhardt and then Oglethorpe. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Dan, first time I met you, you were, you were recruiting at the Peach, Peach, not Peach Jam, but Peach State Exposure Camp at Emory. You came up to me and recruited Jacob to me, asked me about his GPA and all that. So, wow. wow. Corey, Corey, six degrees of separation, but that's one that I missed. I love to hear that from, from my yeah, Emory. Yeah. Yep. Jacob, it really is a small world, isn't it? Here's your giving us our little circle. <laughs> You've aged a lot better than him, Dan. I will say that. <laughs> For a guy who looks just like me. <laughs> hey, I've looked like this a lot longer than you, so I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. It's not much of a race from the fastest tractors 11 miles an hour. <laughs> wow. Okay. We'll have to add that, Corey, to our list. Uh, the the, the one-liners, you guys, you guys are full of them. Oh, and you sometimes, if you're me, you step away from the supper table and disappear because you don't want to hear. No, you don't. <laughs> you never step away. <laughs> you egg that stuff on. What are we talking about? Supper table was a bad one. I should have gone. Supper table. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that, as we close, here's the let's all come back together for dessert. Um, Josh, Jacob, you got something here on the air with all the listeners that you'd like to share to your dad about about life, about basketball, about something you're still angry about, any of that. You gotta <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> for that. And and Milt, same to you to your boys, um, uh, to close it out here. If you can each kind of share a message to to dad and then to your boys. I play with players, I, I play with players I ever watched play. Josh and Jay. No doubt. I meant to say that a minute ago. It, it it drove me all over the state of Georgia. I drive three hours to watch one of them played two minutes and was happy, you know, with mm. your children. It's been a great ride in this game, but it's really fun with your children. That's awesome. Love that. Get sappy, Josh. Uh, I had to do this so y'all wouldn't attack me. <laughs> well, I just, if we're going to do the family business, why couldn't you have been a doctor or a lawyer? <laughs> you know, uh, something with a little bit higher pay scale, you know. that's I'm headed that way now. I'm, I'm working on that part. <laughs> I, I, Dan, I wasn't prepared for that one, man. That's that's a whole nother podcast in and of itself. There's uh, there's probably 50 million things, and they go back to that whole thing about playing hard. I think there's people who um, people who think they know what they're talking about who may have been critical of uh, Dad, especially. They may be critical of me. I don't listen to them, but they want to say, "Oh, you keep it simple, and you just get your kids to play hard." Well, by God, yeah. Um, and it's not, you know, we can get as simple or as complicated as we want to, but uh, these guys that play for him, including us, were brainwashed to run through a brick wall and play hard and want to win. And, um, Corey, I told you one time, you never replied to the text, and I told you I thought you and my dad had the same values, and I thought I may have just lost a friend when I sent that text. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I was really referring to was yeah. that. So, uh, above all else, for anything to – to take from them, I'm, I'm glad it's that. And I hope I can achieve that. I haven't yet, but we're, we're moving in that direction. Look, I coach where Milt Travis once coached. So occasionally, see at the poll stuff still comes to Milt Travis. They really need to update their Rolodex or whatever, but uh, <laughs> it gets put in my box and dad still works for our school system. But uh, I, I've told dad this before. Uh, and one of his assistants said he is like a human Facebook. Before Facebook, dad was Facebook. You can call dad and he will answer. I mean, and if he doesn't answer, it's because he's on the other line and he's, he's gifted at being available. I know that sounds kind of cliche too, but uh, young coaches don't have a lot of mentors. And I was very fortunate to be mentored by him. I've tried to convince him to start charging people for it because it would be an incredible stream of revenue, but that's not something. That's not something that dad and their guys his age probably some of them thought 
but that's a key for us going forward. I think in the profession is, I mean, we're all trying to beat each other on Friday nights, but he, he's available to mentor. He mentors guys who coach against me in my league. And, um, and we grew up that way though. We're coaches, we're friends. We're in this thing together. We're actually after the same goal. And uh, so I, I hope I get that too. You know, I've learned that, that losing to so-and-so is not the end of the world, um, but that's a big thing. He's mentoring a lot of people. And I don't think you use that, that word mentor, but that's the one thing I take away from it. And I can speak for that. He mentors me at times. I call him and he's, he's like a coach whisperer. You know? And Corey, that's a cool thing for me because whether or not you know it, you mentored me in a lot of different ways too. So just vicariously watching you beat me for recruits and things like that, I learned a lot from you. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't ready for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> Hey, and, and we could go on and on with both stories and all this love. Um, <laughs> Kumbaya. If Dan, there. I think I was supposed to tell you that you mentored me, too. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you beat me my last game ever at Buford. You mentored me, okay? Oh. <laughs> oh you, dis you destroyed my 1-3-1 one, one that night, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Hey, so Chesterdy High School. Model high school, little blue collar basketball. That's just the current positions here for this Travis clan of Hoopers. Um, thank you guys, all three of you, for being on and sharing stories and moments. It's been an incredible hour plus here talking hoops and life, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. You got it. And hey, uh, for those listening, stay tuned in on both of our social media platforms on Instagram, a little Off Beaten Path podcast, or on Twitter, Off Beaten Path with the underscore. And it's time to wrap this one up. We appreciate everybody listening. Thank you. See ya. Uh,